As you know, we are in a series of prayer and praying. And on this first Sunday of Black History Month, by the way, happy Black History Month. Yeah, happy Black History Month. I want to look at I want to look at a passage of scripture as we talk about what it means to pray. And um, not quite sure why the Lord gave this to me this way, but let's just see where it goes. And so, God, I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. Come on, why don't you declare that with me? Say, Lord, open the eyes of my heart so that I may, de- so that I may see wondrous things in your law. Amen. Luke chapter 18 today. Luke chapter 18 is where I want to go. And I want to look at the first eight verses. First eight verses. Luke chapter 18. This is how my Bible reads out of the New International Version. It says, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said in a certain town there was a judge who neither, who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. The Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Verse 3, one more time. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice. For the time that is ours to share on this Lord's Weekend, I want to preach using as a subject a prayerful pursuit. A prayerful pursuit. Beloved sisters and brothers, one of the more difficult aspects of prayer and praying is the call for us as disciples of Jesus Christ to persevere even when it seems like God isn't answering. Jesus instructs us to pray to the Father that his kingdom would come and that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yet here we are almost 2,000 years later, and that prayer, though prayed by millions of people millions of times throughout centuries, feels like it's not being answered. And perhaps it appears that there's no greater place that this is seen than in the plight of people of color. For 400 plus years, those of us whose skin has been darkened by nature's sun have been praying the same prayer, a prayer for justice and equity. From the first slave ships that arrived in America in 1619 to the recent recent events regarding modern day lynching of Tyree Nichols in Memphis, it is no secret that black people have been forced to be public spectacle to the various sundry expressions of discrimination inequity and racial injustice. And while it's true that there are those who have experienced glimpses of justice, we know that the fight of justice is one that requires persistence. But if we're honest, let's be real for a moment. We tired. For far too long, like the psalmist, we found ourselves asking and answering, trying to answer the question, Lord, how much more? How many more of our students have to be left back because they can't read on their grade level? How many more times have we have to hear news anchors say, beware, the scene you are about to see is graphic? How many more 
homeless people do we have to pass as we travel up and down I-35? How many more days do we really have to fight? How much more can we take? How many more miscarriages of justice will we have to endure before we give birth to a response that might turn this country upside down? Lord, how much more? Jesus, knowing this, lays out a parable for us. It's about a woman who has an injustice to happen to her that is life-shaping, and the Bible says that she goes to court, the place where she is expected to experience justice, but because of how the system was set up, she could not get the justice that she deserved the first time. Jesus says she kept on coming. She wasn't deterred, but she was determined to get justice by any means necessary until eventually she got what she wanted. As a reminder that there is power in persistence. That's the story. And I preach it this weekend because for many, as we think about this idea of prayer and in particular corporate prayer, this text highlights for us attention, Pastor Clark, that I think needs to be worked out. Because for many of us, when we read this parable, there are those who read this parable only from the perspective of the woman's persistence with respect to prayer. And for some, they only believe that this parable is exclusively about the woman's prayer. And to be sure, I agree that this parable is about a woman's persistence in prayer. In fact, Jesus opens the parable by saying in no uncertain terms that the reason I'm about to tell you this story is so that you can know what it means to pray and not lose heart. But friends, while the scope of the parable is about prayer, the substance of the parable is about justice. The context of the parable is prayer, but the content of the parable is about a woman who is oppressed, who is seeking to receive justice. And I highlight this because that's the tension where many of us live when it comes to our faith walk in Jesus Christ. As members of the Christian community, we often stand in the tension of our salvation and social justice. And because the times that we live in are so filled with tension, we're trying to figure out where should we fall on the spectrum. For some of us, we're falling on one end of the spectrum. When it comes to this idea of justice, there are those who tend to fall on the side of justice where all they want to focus on are the things that we are supposed to do. Or to say it another way, what, should, what we should be doing. They, they believe that the best thing that we can do to bring about justice is to develop a strategy and an agenda. They, they want to know what the policy and the procedure that we need to put in place to bring about justice in our world. And they do this in part, Myron, because they struggle with the idea of praying because in their minds, prayer has been nothing more than an exercise in futility. I mean, after all these years, what has prayer really done for black people? But to understand the idea of justice is to understand that justice is a God thing. The idea of justice and just living is at the core of God's character because the Bible teaches us that God is just. And as such, he has ideas about how he envisioned justice being expressed in the world. And this is why we pray. But to be sure, as disciples of Christ, we got to do more than pray. And even in that, we've got to pray because we've got to develop and receive God's guidance on how he desires for us to meet out justice in the spaces where we live, work, and play. There are those who fall on one end of the spectrum and they only focus on the fight for justice. Then there are others of us in the room, others of us who are watching online who fall on the other end of the spectrum when the on, where the only thing we do is pray. Th there are those who, when tragedy takes place, they quick to put on their social media, send in thoughts <laughs> and prayers. 
Friends, to understand the way God works is to understand that when it comes to this idea of justice, it is not a matter of either or, but rather both and. Justice is not a matter of prayer or pursuit because to have one without the other, Pastor Clark, is to have, as Dr. F. Bruce Williams would declare, it's to have a one-winged bird that exerts a lot of energy, creates a lot of motion, but never really gets off the ground. And so Jesus tells us this parable not only to teach us what it looks like to pray, but what it teaches us, but what it look, but he also teaches us what it looks like to pursue and be persistent. Because to understand God's heart for justice is to know that justice, friends, is meted out at the intersection of passionate pursuit and persistent prayer. And I don't know if you're paying attention to what's going on in the world, but we need both. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to be doing both which then raises the relevant question that needs to be asked and answered as it relates to this idea of letting us pray together friend what should we be praying for as we pursue God's idea of what justice looks like that's the question I want us to wrestle with that's the question I'm attempting to answer from this text and I think it teaches us a couple of things. Here's the first thing I think it teaches us. I want to suggest that this text teaches us that when we go to God in prayer, as we think about our role in the fight for justice and equity in the spaces where we live, work, and play, I think for some of us, we need to pray for the courage to raise our voice against injustice. The text says that there is this woman who goes to an unjust judge and she says to him, give me justice. In other words, sir, something has happened to me and I need you to help me get what rightfully belongs to me. And don't miss the church. To understand this text is to understand its context and to know that she's coming to him knowing that there are obstacles that make it difficult and seemingly impossible for him to answer her request. For starters, she a woman. And in that day, being a woman meant that she had little standing before the law because women were not supposed to go to court. But not only was she a woman, she was more specifically a widow woman which meant she had no man to stand with her in court. And then you add on top of that the fact that she was poor, and in that day in the court system, they could bribe the judge to get the judge to rule in their favor, but she ain't got no money. And she can't bribe the judge even if she wanted to. She is on the lower rung of the cultural ladder. She has no clout, no cash, no connections. She doesn't have much but she does have a voice. <laughs> and the Bible says every day she showed up. And she used what she had because she wanted to put pressure on the system to make sure that justice was served. What kind of nerve must this woman had to have to use her voice in the culture? She was a nobody. But while she may have been viewed as a nobody by the cult. The, the court and the culture she had a clear sense of who she was in her identity and because she knew who she was and she knew who she was connected to she knew that what was going on in her world was not a reflection of the truth of what she deserved so she goes to the judge and says give me what's mine somebody's trying to take advantage of me somebody's trying to take advantage of me and I need some help to give me what I know rightfully belongs to me. She's a part of a system that favors those who are in power and who have influence, but she has neither. But she would not relent because she understood Deacon Box, that sometimes there comes a point when you cannot, a few, you, cannot re, you cannot choose to walk around and let things keep happening without at least saying something. Friend, there comes a point 
when we have to become courageous enough to use our voices to speak up against inequity and injustice. We've got to become bold enough to mess up the status quo. Somebody here, you need to pray because you understand that while we have an expectation for justice and fairness, the truth is justice will never be experienced until those who are unaffected are as upset as those who are. That's why somebody here needs to pray for courage. Because when you do so, you become emboldened to speak for those who are vulnerable and oppressed. For some of us, we need the courage right now to speak up against things that are happening in our world. There are things that are happening on your job. There are things that are happening in your neighborhood. There are things happening in your school district with your children. But we often don't say nothing because in our minds, we're just trying to keep the peace. But I heard in a sermon, Pastor Clark preached by that late freedom fighter Dr. Martin Luther King in a sermon where he labels it when peace becomes obnoxious Dr. King reminds us that if peace means that I've got to engage in stagnant complacency and deadening passivity I don't want it if peace means I've got to accept being a second class citizen I don't want it if peace means I got to keep my mouth shut in the midst of evil and injustice I don't want it if peace means that I'm complacently adjusting to the status quo I don't want that peace King says if peace means I've got to be willing to be exploited economically and dominated politically, humiliated and segregated. I don't want that peace because there's too much at stake. Friend, somebody here, you need to pray for courage to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Because the situation is becoming too dire. There's too many deaths. There are too much suffering. There's too many people hurting. There are too many people who are homeless. There are too many people who are vulnerable for us to walk around with a collective laryngitis. No, we've got to be known as people who cry loud and spare not. I mean, how you going to keep your mouth shut when you see kids who look like your grandchildren whose futures are being determined by third grade reading scores? How you going to keep your mouth shut when you realize that students of color are Attending, who are attending school spend more time with SRO office officers than school counselors. When you understand that we live in a country that has a governor not too far from here who is trying to whitewash the history of people who look like you and me. No, I'm not going to be quiet. No, I'm not going to shut up. No, I'm not going to pipe down because I've got to raise my voice for those who are being exploited and for those who are vulnerable. Lift up your voice and turn to somebody and tell them, open up your mouth and say something. Somebody here, you need to pray for courage to speak up for outsiders. Somebody else here needs to pray for a deeper consciousness regarding your responsibility. That is to say that while shouting and saying something about injustice is a great place to start, we should be simultaneously seeking and praying about the ways in which God may want to use us to be the solution to the problem that we're shouting about. Because the truth of the matter is, for some of us, in fact, as I look around this room, probably for most of us, we are not in the position of the widow. For most of us, we are not experiencing disenfranchisement at the level that some of our brothers and sisters are experiencing. We are more like the judge than we are the widow. <laughs> we, we got power. We got influence. We got resources. But the challenge for some of us is that we've sacrificed the sense of being a part of the all of mankind for the pursuit of our own personal materialism. Help me, Holy Ghost. We've gotten so caught up in our pursuit of the American dream that we've forgotten the principle of lifting as we climb. So for some of us, life is about me. Not we. 
And it's hard to focus on justice, Pastor Clark, when you're too busy focusing on just us. But friends, if we're going to be the kind of disciples that Jesus is calling us to be, this means we've got to learn how to value what God values. And ladies and gentlemen, what we fail to realize often as we matriculate through this life with all of the blessings and the trinkets and the things that we have, with all of the travel that we enjoy and all of the accoutrements of life that we enjoy, one of the things that we fail to realize is that when it comes to justice, Jesus takes sides. God is the God of the oppressed. Okay, so I heard this illustration. I got to use it here. All right, so when the slaves were coming over to American soil from West Africa, praying was going on in the ship. The white men were praying for safe passage. And those who were in the hull of the ship we're praying for freedom. You think God was just interested in them white men getting to America safely? I feel the Holy Ghost deep in this, this room. No, because God is the God of the oppressed. Listen to what James says in James chapter 4 verse 6. God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. God acts to liberate those who are poor and oppressed. And by extension, those of us who claim to be extensions of God ought to also stand on the side of those who are poor and oppressed. I guess what I'm trying to say is that because God cares about injustice, we who are his representative in the earth ought to care about injustice as well. And so as believers, as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to embrace the reality. That we got a responsibility to intentionally, with specificity, look out for those who are the least, the looked over, the left out, the little, those who are the last. It, it was a dark, cold, early morning in 1964. A woman by the name of Kitty Genovese Charity, who was 28, she was a bar manager. She was coming home from work. It was late. And she was assaulted 100 feet from her front door. She was stabbed. And for about 15 minutes, Miss Kathy, she screamed to the top of her lungs. Her assailant, her assailant told her to shut up. But she kept on screaming. She screamed out, oh my God, he stabbed me. Somebody help me. Several neighbors heard her cry. But because, because it was a cold night, with the windows closed, only a few of them recognized that the cry was a cry for help. But she kept on screaming. So much so until her attacker dragged her down the hall to the side of an exterior hallway uh, and raped her and killed her. Reporters said that when police came to investigate, they asked the neighbors in the apartment, did y'all hear anything? And much to the dismay, the shock and chagrin of these detectives, it turned out that at some point, Pastor Clark doing two separate attacks that lasted about 30 minutes, 38 people heard this woman scream. And a couple of them even opened their window and looked out and saw her being assaulted and said, shut up, we're trying to sleep. And when the police asked why they didn't do nothing, the response of all of them was, we didn't want to get involved. Friend, what an indictment that there were at least 38 people who heard what was going on and who knew that something was wrong, but they did nothing about it. Friends, it is, it, it is easier for us, and this is why I'm preaching this, because I'm convinced it's easy for, easier for us to see the ways in which people are being mistreated and mishandled, exploited and oppressed. We can see things now in real time that are impacting our world. But for some of us, we still walk around with the misbelief that if it ain't impacting me personally, then it ain't my problem. But friends, when you remember that God is on the side of the oppressed, it ought to compel you to do your part in meeting out justice in whatever part that you play in the world. God has given you and I as individuals and us as a community of faith the creativity 
the resources, the ingenuity to create a far better future for all, but it's going to require us taking action. And while none of us can do everything, all of us can do something. Henry David Thoreau, that great literature, uh, man of great literature, he was thrown in jail a short time after the uh, American-Mexican War. He was standing in opposition to America's involvement in the Mexican War. And while he's in jail, Dr. Quinlan, one, one of his friends came to visit him. Looking through the bars, the friend said to Henry David Thoreau, hey man, what you doing in here? To which Henry David Thoreau, in response, says, I got to ask you, what you doing out there? And can I ask you, church? What are you doing out there for the sake of justice? What are you doing with your gifts, your influence, your connections, your resources, your position to push the needle forward for the cause of justice and to help bring about the reality of God's kingdom on earth as it is being done in heaven? Because I don't know if you realize this or not, we've been called to compassion. Let me lean in a little bit. It's the principle of Ubuntu. That whatever's happening to you happens to me. That whatever impacts you impacts me. Whatever hurts you hurts me. Whatever injures you injures me. Because we understand that our lives are interconnected and our faith is inextricably linked to our capacity to see the Imago Dei, the image of God in every person we come across as a human being. Regardless to whether or not we agree with their sexual orientation or regardless to where they live or regardless to what their gender is or regardless to what their age is. There ought to come a point, friends, where you take personal responsibility for somebody and say your struggle is my struggle your pain is my pain your misfortune is my misfortune when you suffer I ought to suffer a little bit too because I understand that I'm not really free until you free and ain't none of us free until everybody is free so we got to focus on justice and not just us because Frederick Douglass says There comes a point where we got to move from praying on our knees to praying with our feet. That the sense of justice, help me to preach this right, that we desire, the semblance of freedom that we're searching for is found when we all make the effort to try to do something. That's why you need to pray. Because your time ain't going to let you do everything. Don't let the fact that you can't do everything keep you in a place where you do no thing. Friend, that's what our eight great causes are about. We understand that God has blessed us with tremendous resources, both financial and human, to be in the city for the city. And while God has given us the grace to do all the things that God has given us the grace to do, As we push God's kingdom agenda forward, we recognize we can't be at every meeting. So that's why we partner with other organizations in the city who are already doing the work. And this is why when you join our church and you partner with us, one of the first things we invite you to do is to get connected to a great cause. Because the Bible tells us that there is coming a day. When Jesus is going to crack the sky and when he returns, he says very clearly, I'm going to separate those who are sheep from those who are the goats. And here's the criteria for which he's going to determine who's going to come and experience the inheritance. He's going to say, when I was hungry, you fed me. I wish I had somebody who read the Bible. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I was in prison, Miss Barbara Shirley, you came to visit me. And they're going to ask when we do this. Because we was just living our lives. And Jesus is going to say, hallelujah, when you do it to the least of these. I feel the Holy Ghost. I swear I do. You do it to me. But, 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 but here's, I'm, I'm going to get there, I promise. Because I can't, I can't leave us like this, right? We got to end with some level of hope, right? So I promise you we're going to get there. But I want to warn you, friends, that when you pray this prayer, 
one of a couple of things is going to happen. One of the things that's going to happen is God's probably going to call you to do something outside of your comfort zone. <laughs> Which means that in order to fulfill God's mission in the earth, you're going to have to take a risk. And for somebody here, here's the risk that you're going to have to take. You're going to have to look at your life and the ways that you have been privileged. And you're going to have to do an internal investigation on the ways that you have benefited from the privileges that you have benefited from. And you've got to determine within your own soul how you're going to leverage some of your privilege for the benefit of those who don't have that privilege. And for others of us, he's going to call us to take a risk again and do something outside of our our comfort zone. Friend, I guess what I'm trying to say as I push toward the close is be found getting in some good trouble. And understand that it's probably going to cost you. Come here, plumber from Martin. May cost you a little. <laughs> May cost you a lot. Some of y'all go back and watch the first season of Martin. I think it's around episode four or five. It's the dead plumber episode. May cost you a little. May cost you a lot. But it is going to cost you. So what are we going to pray for? Courage to speak up against injustice. All of us are praying for a deeper consciousness regarding the ways that God is calling us to live a life of compassion toward others. But when you pray, this text teaches us one last thing, and that's this. Pray with confidence that God will respond to bring about reform. Friend, I'm, I'm done when I tell you this. To fully understand this parable and to appreciate in all of its fullness is to realize that this parable is not a parable of comparison. So here's what I'm saying. We understand Jesus tells parables often to give us an earthly story that has a heavenly meaning. That's what parables are. Earthly stories that have eternal implications. And in the story, you would assume that Jesus is saying that in order to get God to move, you got to keep on praying. This is not a parable of comparison. God is not comparing, Jesus rather is not comparing our father to this unjust judge. This is a parable not of comparison, it's a, par it's a parable of contrasting. The parable is a contrast between the worst of man and the best of God. It's what theologians and scholars will call an argument from the lesser to the greater. In other words, Jesus is saying that if an earthly judge who is devoid of all sentiments of justice, who doesn't care nothing about God and don't care what nobody thinks, if he would give a woman justice because she persisted, how much more will God, who loves you, Make sure that you get the justice that you need. God is saying, you've been asking how much more because you've been frustrated. And I'm asking how much more because I'm trying to demonstrate to you the level that I plan on being faithful. Because I am not an unjust judge. Here's the problem, though. When we pray sometimes, particularly against the backdrop of something that we got to persist in, like justice, we, be we begin to get hopeless. We think... That there's no hope for the situation. That somehow God doesn't care. We begin to think that God is just like the unjust judge. And so what often happens is we see prayer and praying as impotent or empty at best. Because we think when we go to God in prayer, we trying to persuade or convince or wear down God to do something that we need him to do. We often come to God with this idea. God is somewhere out there waiting to be persuaded. But to understand how God works, friends, and this is where I celebrate. This is where I give God praise. To know how God works when it comes to prayer 
is to understand that we don't have to overcome God's reluctance. That God is more willing to hear us more than we are willing to pray. That God is more ready to answer our prayers than we are ready to ask. Because we don't serve a God who is unconcerned about our well-being. God is not like that. Because when it comes to the things of God, it ain't a matter of if he going to answer. It's a matter of when. Because I heard my big mama say that he may not come when you want him. I feel good now. But he's always on time. And so the text says... Because this woman kept coming, she kept showing up, because she kept using her voice, because she didn't quit, because she didn't throw in the towel, the Bible says there came a moment when she finally got a response to remind us of the power of persistence in prayer to a God who is ready to answer your prayer. So here's what I'm telling you as we close. Keep on praying. Keep on persisting. Let's do it. Until there's justice on the job. Keep on praying. Keep on persisting until there's justice in education. Keep on praying. Keep on persisting until there's justice in policing. Keep on praying. Keep on persisting because until there's justice in our economy because we serve a God who is eager and who is willing to answer our prayer. And here's how I know that he's eager to answer our prayer for justice because he knows what it means to experience injustice you do realize that Jesus who was a poor dark skinned man found himself in court arrested on trumped up charges for crimes that he didn't commit this black man this dark skin man who wasn't necessarily black but was olive skin that's what you told us this olive skin man who found himself in court being led from court to court in the middle of the night he stood trial seven times without due process a court appointed attorney or a bail hearing this good poor dark skinned man was sentenced to die by a man who knew he was innocent and the bible tells us that one dark friday they beat him like a dark skinned man until his face was unrecognizable they beat him until the flesh on his back hung like strips of ribbon they spit on him they mocked him they nailed his hands and his feet they put a crown on his head to mock him because he called himself a king and the bible says for three hours he hung on the cross like a common criminal between two known criminals and like this woman it appeared that god wasn't trying to hear his plea in fact the bible says that while he's hanging there he cries out to God my God my God why has you forsaken me Jesus knew what injustice felt like but unlike the unjust judge God responded to Jesus's plea and vindicated them because I heard one black preacher say early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hands to remind us the power of persistence that's why I give God praise in spite of the oppression that's why I give him praise and I give him glory in spite of the hardship because God has given me through Jesus Christ the capacity to pray for courage and confidence because we come from a people who knew what it meant to persist from the hall of the slave ship through chattel slavery through Jim Crow through the lynchings as they worshiped in the brush harbors singing up above my head I hear music in the air there must be a God somewhere they persisted because they believed that God was on the side of the oppressed so they came through the whoopings they came through the brutality they came through the prison industrial complex and they 
did so, knowing that they probably wouldn't be able to experience the freedoms that they fought for, but they kept on persisting because they understood that the freedom that they were fighting for wasn't just for them, but it was for their children and their children's children. So I tell you today, when you pray and you come up against an obstacle, stand still, open your mouth and pray to God. Whatever you do, you bet not quit you may pause but you bet not quit you may cry but you bet not quit because i heard one way in psalm 30 verse 5 that weeping may endure for the night but joy i got my black baptist suit on joy joy is coming in the morning if you go give it praise for the power and the capacity to keep moving forward, somebody shout, keep going, keep going, keep going. Ah, I know he's all right. Friend, the only reason we're here today is because people who got our DNA didn't quit. And friend, this is why we can't quit. Did you hear what I said? Because the future of my sons are on the line. The future of your granddaughter is on the line. And so we keep fighting. We keep persisting. We keep praying and we leverage our privilege. For the benefit of those who don't have it. Everybody stand to your feet. I think there's something to pray about, don't you? Because I'm confident that as I was preaching, God put a situation on your mind. Because I know we face it all the time. And I'm not just talking about the national stuff that comes on the news. I'm not just talking about that. I'm talking about the stuff in the spaces where you live, work, and play. There's somebody on your job who needs you to speak up because they too afraid that they're going to lose their job if they call out a boss who has sexually harassed them. But you got the influence. Can't get no help. No help in here. And so we've been called to pray for justice. Who would say, I need to pray for more courage? Yeah, this is a safe space. Ain't nobody judging because all of us at some point going to raise our hand. You need to pray for courage? So who else would say, I need to pray for deeper consciousness? God, open my eyes so that I can see the ways in which injustice is happening in my world. How many of you would say, I need more compassion because these things have broken me down so much that I've started to become numb to them and I don't care as much. I don't care as deeply. So I go to my house, close my door, and I don't come out unless I have to. Whatever you raise your hand for, I'm going to invite you in your own way to search your soul. And I want everybody, and I'll close this in a minute and open up the doors of the church, but I want you to pray for that thing. How, how, how do you need God to lead you as, as, as we pray for justice? Come on, begin praying that now. I am persuaded, Lord, 
to love you I have been trained to bless your name and I am constrained by this great gospel forever to worship you come on pray pray hard I know you just pray at a surface level prayer dig a little let dig another level deeper I am persuaded Lord to love you I have been changed to bless your name Father, we declare in this moment that in the midst of such racial injustice, such economic inequality, such educational inequity, such homelessness and gentrification, that we want justice. But we understand that justice is not just about the policy that we put in place. You've called us to meet out justice at the intersection of prayer and pursuit. And so in this moment, we are praying that you would show us how to pursue. Show us where we need to pursue. That you would grant us the courage to actually pursue. And to do so because you stand on the side of those who have been oppressed. And that you've graced us with great privilege and great opportunity. And so, God, would you show us how to leverage that privilege and to trust you that when we pour into the lives of others, we don't end up losing anything, but we gain a greater sense of who you are and, by extension, a greater sense of who we are. Thank you for this time that we have spent in your presence. Thank you for your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said together, amen. Before we leave, I want to invite somebody to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because everything that I told you today, it had a hinge of justice and social justice in it. But understand, the only reason why we know what social justice looks like in the earth is because God is a God of justice. And because God is concerned about justice, God is so much, justice is so much at the core of who God is. God said, I got to give you grace. Because justice means so much to me. That if I treated you based on how justice ought to be meted out, you would have been dead a long time ago. So I had to marry grace with it. Please, if you would be so kind. I'm going to let those of you who are walking walk. But please, if you would be so kind, honor the sanctity of this moment because this is worship. In fact, everything that we do in our worship is for this moment. And so please, if you would be so kind, honor the sanctity of this moment. We're about to go home together. So if you have yet to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe you're a freedom justice fighter. You don't really know what you're fighting for until you surrender that to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't know what you're fighting for fully until you surrender that to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you want to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, want to make him save your leader, as soon as the worship experience is over with, room 145 to my left and your right, you see that lady with that pretty silver hair? She got a hand raised. That's my big sister, Alicia Garrett. She and members of our spiritual decision team will help you to make the greatest decision you could ever make. 
commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe you want to be a part of this church who leverages their influence for those who don't have such influence. You want to be a part of this kind of community of faith? We'd love to be your brothers in the fight for justice. Our pastor would absolutely love to be your pastor. You want to make that decision, you're on site, room 145. If you want to make that decision and you're watching us online, you can dial the number that's on your screen, 877-632-0702. Aren't you glad you came to church today?